Hi there. Thank you all so much for having me here. Uh, it's an incredible honor to speak to this audience. I'm not a museum's person per se. I, my, my closest brush with it is that my great uncle Boris Rachman was the curator of the Popov Museum until he died a few years ago in St. Petersburg. And I was privileged to tour it several times with him. And standing in museums, especially rooms like this, is a rather humbling experience. I've spoken in some pretty nice rooms before, but I think this one really takes the cake. Um, I have to warn you, if you haven't noticed by now, that I am one of nature's fast talkers. Uh, for some time, I was a, a delegate at the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva uh, for an NGO, and I was known there as the scourge of the simultaneous translation corps. I would stand up to speak as slow as I, as I could, really, and I'd turn around, and there would be the booths with the translators, and 201, they'd be doing this. So given that there's a lot of non-native English speakers, and maybe a lot of people who are not accustomed to a Canadian accent as well, if you find me talking too quickly, or when you find me talking too quickly, please do this, and I'll slow down, I promise. So there's a little slightly apocryphal story I'd like to open this talk with. It's, it's not entirely apocryphal, but it's not the whole truth either. But I think it speaks to a museum's audience. And it goes like this. The wheelbase of the Roman chariot was determined by the metallurgical science of Roman blacksmiths. The wheelbase of the Roman chariot determined the width of the Roman road. The width of the Roman road determined the width of the wheelbase of the modern cart. The width of the modern cart determined the width of the modern road. The, myth of the width of the modern road determined the width of the modern car. The width of the modern car determined the width of the modern truck, which determined the width of the modern shipping container, and so the width of the modern train. The space shuttle's fuel tanks were transported on a modern train and could be no wider than would fit on a modern train car which is to say that the space program's engineering parameters were prefigured by the metallurgical expertise of Roman blacksmiths. Technological decisions redound through the ages. So it's a gross oversimplification. That is not exactly how it happened. History is a lot more complicated than that. But I tell it by way of parable more than history. And the reason to recount it now is that this moment is a liminal moment in the future history of the information age. Uh, uh, we are presently building the electronic nervous system of the future. We are dwellers on what is still an electronic frontier, and in our hands now, at this early moment, is the power to establish the norms the laws and the practices that will echo through the ages that are yet to come. Now we call this the information age, and it is, and it may feel, as we heard before, that change has been buffeting us for 20 years, and that the world is, has changed in a way that is almost unimaginable, and perhaps we're finally reaching a plateau. But really, the information age is just getting started. We live in a world that is increasingly made out of computers. Um, your car is a computer that you put your body into. It then hurdles down the motorway at 120 kilometers an hour with you trapped inside of it. Most modern homes, most modern institutions are computers that we put our body and sometimes our art into. In many of those institutions, if you were to remove the computers, the institutions would become uninhabitable very quickly. And in many very modern institutions, if you left the computers out for any appreciable length of time, those buildings would never be habitable again. And it's not just that we put our bodies into computers. We increasingly put computers into our bodies. Um, some of you are my age. Some are a little younger. Some are a little older. Most of us, though, grew up with the Walkman, or if we're a little younger, with MP3 players. And we have all logged enough punishing earbud hours that there will come a day, if we live long enough, when we'll need a hearing aid. And it is vanishingly unlikely that that hearing aid 
will be a beige brown retro plastic hipster analog transistor hearing aid, it's far more probable that that will be a general purpose computer that lives in your body, that hears what you hear, that has the power to make you hear things that aren't there, that has the power to stop you from hearing things that are there, and that has the power to tell other people what you're hearing. Increasingly, we have implanted pacemakers, we have implanted limbs. I was recently in an airport lounge in America, and I got into a fight, as many of you have, over the destiny of the sole electrical outlet in that lounge. I wanted to recharge my laptop. The man I was arguing with, and, and to be fair to me, I, I quickly gave up as soon as I realized this, the man I was arguing with wanted to recharge his leg. Now, the world is made of computers, and there is really only one kind of computer. We have all of our modern computers adhere to something we call Turing completeness in the world of computer science. A Turing complete computer is a computer that can execute every instruction that we can express in symbolic logic. And in some important way, all computers are equivalent. A very fast computer can do exactly what a very slow computer can do, only faster. Which is to say that all the programs that you can run on every computer can be run on every other computer, although possibly over an unfeasibly long length of time, the universe might burn out before the program is finished running. But what this means, a world where the world is made of computers and there is only one kind of computer, is that any policy we create governing the design and use of computers redounds through every corner of our experience and our existence. So let's talk for a moment about archiving and cultural dissemination, cultural preservation, and this information age. The information age has been attended by two contradictory and overwhelming shifts in the way that we think about value. The first and most visible one has been the rise of neoliberal glo globalization, uh, a project that requires that we evaluate all of our institutions and all of our artifacts through a market lens. Um, and this has a great distorting effect when it's applied to a public institution. Take schools, for example. Schools increasingly have been reimagined as factories whose products are educated children and whose workers are teachers and whose management are the administrators and whose board of directors is the government and whose shareholders are the public. And like any business, schools have to show that they are spending their shareholders' money wisely by creating quarterly reports in which a number goes up. Now, there are really only two things that we can quantify in the production of educated children. One of them is attendance, and the other one is standardized test scores, both of which are only cursorily connected with anything like education. But we have reified these two factors in our public schools beyond all sanity. Schools have been refactored to relentlessly focus on these two numbers at the expense of everything else. So if you're a grade two teacher and a student walks into your classroom and picks a book off the shelf and starts reading to herself and has her brain catch fire with that sheer vertiginous joy of reading, the job of a contemporary teacher is not to get the hell out of the way and let the learning happen. The job of the contemporary teacher is to intervene to stop the learning so that the preparation for the standardized test will not be disrupted. When I was seven years old, I walked into my classroom and picked a copy of Alice in Wonderland down from the shelf and lay on the carpet and read and read. And the teacher saw what was happening and let it unfold. She recognized the everyday extraordinariness of true learning that was taking place, and she allowed the student to kindle that spark of interest into this blazing passion, my lifelong love affair with books. But the school as factory model has no room for that process. The indiscriminate application of market logic makes a nonsense out of activities that are fundamentally non-market. And these non-market activities include archiving, scholarship, cultural preservation, and cultural communication. To 
describe the business of museums in market logic is to apply a metaphor that is both highly suspect and highly susceptible to an intellectually dishonest form of manipulation. Think for a moment of the worst of our public-private partnerships in digitization. For example, the Department of Defense in the United States partnering with T3 Media, or the British Film Institute in the United Kingdom where I live partnering with Siemens. In these projects, the commercial operator is brought in to digitize public collections, and then those digitized collections are put behind a paywall so that the contractor can recoup their costs. The market logic goes like this. A company like Siemens is making a large investment in, a, in, in scanning these public assets, so they have the right to recoup that investment. They're assuming the risk. They should reap some reward. But this is a highly selective account of how capitalism works. In Silicon Valley, where a lot of this technology stuff has its start, we have a grand tradition of startups who court investors for what are ultimately very high risk and ultimately high reward projects that seem improbable from the outset, whether those are search engines or Bitcoin. Um, it's unheard of for most startups to be profitable from the start. Many of them run for many years without being profitable and rely on their investors to keep them afloat. Amazon is still not profitable to this day. So entrepreneurs who are starting businesses seek out angel investors, individuals who put early money into businesses in return for a generous ownership stake in that business. Now, almost every angel investment comes to nothing. The money is flushed down the drain, but there is no shortage of angel investors because the reward for betting successfully is incredible. If you're the first investor in a business, it means the business pays you a much larger dividend than it pays any of the investors who come along later. If you assume the risk, you get the reward. Now let's go back to our public archives. For decades, for centuries, the public plays the role of the angel investor in our public institutions, paying and paying year after year, century after century, to keep public inst institutions afloat while they seek out their profitability. And now these archives have arrived at their moment. The world of dig digitization has unlocked untold value in these public collections. Through digitization, the whole world can now use these archives simultaneously. Scholars everywhere can text mine them. They can be used to start businesses and create new curriculum. Now this is the thing every entrepreneur dreams of. The moment when a weird and unlikely idea is validated by the marketplace. When it arrives at its cultural moment. When the idea of a bare bones search tool like Google suddenly rockets to ascendancy and leaves behind incumbents like Yahoo and AltaVista in the dust. At that moment, it is customary for the angels and the entrepreneurs to seek out a venture capitalist and ask them and sell a very small slice of the company to them for the money that is required to expand production to meet the new need. Now, the angels are not crowded out here by the venture capitalists. On the contrary, when the big investors come in, even though they're putting a lot more money in than the angels put in to begin with, they get a much smaller slice of the business because the angels assumed all the risk. The venture capitalists only came along once the business had been proven out. But this is the opposite of the approach that we take with Siemens and the British Film Institute or the BFI uh, or, or T3 Media and the Department of Defense. We, the public, have been the angels of these public institutions. We built up the value in our public assets. The return on our investment is access to those assets without encumbrance or let because they belong to us, the public. The Johnny-come-lately digitization firms are the venture capitalists. They are latecomers to the party who only put their money in once our money has proven out the success of the model. The risk they assume 
paying to take pictures of our stuff is infinitesimal compared to the risk of establishing the institution in the first place. And yet, the terms they demand result in the confiscation of our equity in our public assets. This relatively minor, low-risk task of taking pictures trumps assembling the collection to begin with. And management, the governments of the neoliberal era, give it to them. Even in the dubious enterprise of applying market logic to public enterprises, this is a, this is a titanic ripoff that no business would get away with in the real world of business. But of course, this way of viewing a public institution is a nonsense from start to finish. The public doesn't invest in cultural preservation because we perceive a profitable upside lurking in the future. We invest in, public, in, in cultural preservation, in archiving, and in access because these things are public goods. They're not primarily market activities. Using the return on investment to calculate the value of the museum is like adding up all the money you spent on your child's upbringing and handing her a bill when she graduates from college. It is the work of a sociopath. Our cultural institutions exist to tell us who we are, where we have been, and where we are going. So where are we going? The information age is in some important sense the beginning of history. It is the moment at which every person has swiftly and unexpectedly become the archivist of her own life, a curator of a billion blips of ephemeral communications and ruminations and interactions. And as any archaeologist who's ever rejoiced at finding a midden will tell you, knowing how normal people live their lives in antiquity is a rare and amazing thing. Which would you rather see? An oil painting of a Victorian monarch? A ramrod stiff posed photo of your great-great-grandmother in her confirmation smock? Or the transcript of a hundred communications she had with her family? Those moment-to-moment -moment ephemera, uh, that moment-to-moment -moment ephemera is the history that we are recording today. And the tools by which we accomplish this archival business are, of course, computers. The computers we carry in our bags, in our pockets. We wear them in and on our bodies. And there is one group of people in this world who understand how archiving works, who understand the importance of the ephemeral in great pools, who can steer us to personal and cultural practices of preservation, archiving, dissemination, and access. It's this group of people. It's the museum sector. Just as librarians who toiled for centuries at the coal face of information and authority, systematizing the process of figuring out which sources to trust and why and when, are more needed now uh, than ever, when we are all of us required to sort the credible from the non-credible every time we type a keyword into a search box, so too are curators and archivists more needed now than ever, now that we are all archiving and curating all day long. The museum sector can help us lay the roads that lead us from these primitive information chariots here at the dawn of the history of the information age to the future of information spaceships that carry us to the stars. Now the stakes are high because the self-serving application of market logic to information is even more absurd and harmful than the application of that logic to public institutions. Since the 1970s, technologically illiterate politicians and economists have bandied about the idea of an information economy based on buying and selling information in ever thinner slices. They conjured up a bizarre utopia in which you can buy and sell, in, in which you um, have the right to watch a movie at home but not at work or on holiday, where you have the right to stream but not save a song, where you have the right to use a program on one phone but not to bring it with you to your next phone. Ultimately, it descends into this kind of weird funging of the rights down to things like, you are allowed to read this novel on Wednesdays but only between the hours of five and seven and only if you're standing on one leg. Now, I was once 
for my sins, a delegate to the DVB forum. These are the people who set the standards for digital television in Europe, working on their standards for digital rights management for television. And we had this just insane through the looking glass conversation about whether or not it should be possible for a broadcaster to flag a program so that you could watch it in the same room as the receiver but not run a wire into another room in your house and watch it there. And I said, come on, what is this for? There's no legal system in the world that lets a broadcaster dictate which room you can watch a television show in. And there was a, a guy there, a representative from the Motion Picture Association, the uh, Hollywood lobby, and he said, look, if you're watching a movie in one room that's being received in another room that has value, and if it has value, we should have the right to sell it. Siva Vadyanthan, he calls this the if value then right theory of copyright. I don't call it if value then right. I call it the urinary tract infection business model. Because it takes the idea that all of the value latent in the tools that you use should flow in a healthy gush on demand and turns that gush into a painful, burning dribble. Every time you want to do something, it squeezes out in one tiny, burning droplet with someone there collecting a toll for it. Um, this is self-serving market logic at its worst. Even if we will stipulate for the sake of argument that a market has any place in determining what you do in your own house, why should the pseudo-property right to determine how you watch TV trump the actual property right to have your TV do what you tell it? That's the crux of the matter. This is where it all comes together. The concept of an information economy predicated on selling you access to information piecemeal requires necessarily that the computers that you use be designed to disobey you. If you only have the right to watch a movie in your bathroom while eating a ciabatto and whistling Dixie, your computer must have the ability to refuse when you tell it to play the movie under any other circumstances. This is an offensive idea whether you buy the markets are all logic or not. But let's start with the market logic because that's the easy one. If you own something, it should do what you tell it to do. The dead hand of some remote authority should not weigh on your refrigerator door deciding when you can have a snack, nor should it bar you from your closet if you want to change your clothes. That's what property is, stuff that's yours, that you get to boss around. Before the 1970s, the term intellectual property was not in widespread use. Only a few nutcase extremists ever used the term. For the most part, we talked about copyright, or sometimes in scholarly circle, we talked about the author's monopoly. This idea of, of copyright as a policy, as opposed to intellectual property as a concept, uh, acknowledges that what we have in copyright is a temporary and limited regulatory monopoly primarily aimed at industrial entities. The promulgation of the term intellectual property has been a conceptual disaster. When you stop talking about specifics like copyright and what the statute of copyright says, and instead you start talking about intellectual property, you end up talking about this idea that anything that has some connection with someone's intellect remains their property forever. The term intellectual property means whatever you point it at. Um, Everything in our world has some intersection with someone's intellect. Um, the facade on your house, the gears on your bicycle, and the shirt on your back all originated in some sense with some act of human intellectual agency. But if your purchase or acquisition of those objects does not terminate their creator's interest in them, where does the idiocy end? Does the butcher get to tell you how to cook your steak? Can the cobbler tell you when to shine your shoes? So, let's forget the property argument. 
because your house is not a Greek agora, and knowledge isn't property, and markets are not how we determine non-market activity. Scholarly journals do not conduct the peer review process through a series of bits and put, bids and puts attempting to discover the true price of the knowledge in the article. They do something that is not a market at all. They do something that is different. It's scholarly. It descends from the Enlightenment and it is predicated on ideas like reproducibility, like um, uh, uh, public discussion and debate and public access. So let's talk about the future of the history, uh, the, fu the history of the future instead. The shape of the spaceships that are prefigured by the wheelbases of these primitive new informational chariots. What does it mean to design a computer that disobeys you? Well, think back to that idea of Turing completeness. There is only one way that computer scientists know to design a computer, and that's to make a computer that can run every valid program, that can execute every instruction that can be expressed in symbolic logic. And yet, every iPhone and iPad is designed to stop you from running code that doesn't come from the App Store so that Apple can collect its 30% commission from the software vendors who are trying to sell you their wares. And your satellite receiver won't connect to a personal video recorder that lets you record shows and save them. And your PS4 won't run games that haven't been approved by Sony's Politburo. And your Kindle won't let you load books that you inherit from your parents' estate onto your device. So if there's only one kind of computer and it can run all the programs, how is this magical trick of not running some of the programs that you want accomplished? Well, the answer is it's not. Those devices will run any program, but the devices are designed to ship with spyware on them out of the box. Hidden programs that lurk in their depths, that watch everything you do, that wait for you to do something on the forbidden list, and then swim to the surface and say, I can't let you do that, Dave. An iPhone is not a computer that can't run non-App Store apps. It's a computer that won't let you run non-App Store apps. Designed from the ground up, ground up to have programs that you can't shut down, programs that watch to see whether the code that you're running was signed by Apple, to have those programs hide from their users, to intentionally obfuscate the location of their files and the operating system. It is a computer whose operating system has, by design, a moat in its eye. When the, computer, when the computer is asked by its owner, are you running a program that stops me from choosing which software I use? The computer has been designed to lie and say no. And when the, when the user says to the computer, please run this other program that allows me to run any software I want, the computer has been designed to disobey and say no. And that is the nature of digital restrictions in the age of universal general purpose computers. Whether the computer is a self-driving car that's being designed so that it doesn't drag race, or a 3D printer that's being designed so that it can't print a gun, or an iPad that's being designed so that it won't run unauthorized software, the outcome, whether or not you support the goal, the outcome is always a computer that hides things from its owner. In a world where computers are inside of our bodies, where our bodies are inside of computers, this is an insane idea. What happens if your computers betray you? Well, this season, we discovered what happens when the computers owned by the American retailer Target run software that Target doesn't know about. 100 million people's credit card details leak out. But it can, be, uh, it can have consequences for you even if you're not an American retail giant. Take a, a young woman named Cassidy Wolf. Uh, Cassidy Wolf is the reigning Miss Teen USA. She's a beauty queen. And last year, September 2013, the FBI arrested a man who had convinced her to install software on her computer through trickery that allowed him to spy on her through her web camera, 
take photos of her in the nude, capture her social media passwords, send her an email saying, I will post these nude photos of you to social media, to your Facebook, and so on, if you don't perform live sex acts for me on your camera. Now, she called the FBI and they caught him. And he had more than 100 victims all over the world, including minor children. And he was not the most prolific person who's been caught doing this. And it, the consequences can be worse. If you're a civilian who's been wrongly murdered by a US drone, the information leaking out of your computer about your location is a matter of life and death. There is no way for us to design a computer that disobeys its owner when ordered to do so by the police, by the government, or by a corporation that doesn't also disobey its owner when a criminal, a creep, or a spy hijacks that facility and uses it for his own purpose. Once your computer has a back door in it, everyone can come through it. And this is just the beginning. In November 2012, the late security researcher Barnaby Jack demonstrated an attack that allowed him to hijack implanted defibrillators through their wireless interfaces to cause them to seek out any other implanted defibrillators in a 10 meter radius. So for example, if you visited the clinic where your, your defibrillator was implanted, all of the other people there who had implanted defibrillators, it would seek them out and find them. It would hijack them as well and enlist them into this task, and then at a set moment would deliver lethal shocks to everyone who had been so infected. There's a reason that former US Vice President Dick Cheney had the wireless interface turned off on his implanted defibrillator. Um, computers that don't obey you are a scary thing. So here we are at the beginning of history, and we have seen what happens when our computers and our networks are designed to betray their owners rather than to protect them. Edward Snowden lifted the rock that the NSA and GCHQ were hiding beneath and showed us how deep the rot had spread. They show, he showed us that every channel of communication, every messaging channel, every email channel, even World of Warcraft had been compromised. The NSA's theory of the history of the future might be summed up as the greater manure pile theory of crime fighting. The idea that if you just pile the manure up high enough, there must be a pony underneath it somewhere. If you can wiretap every conversation, capture every meeting, know about everything that every person does, you will be able to catch all the bad guys. Now, this method has many uh, conceptual problems, but most significant is that it ignores the important contributions of the great scholar, scholar of criminal justice, Cardinal Rishi Liu, who said, if you give me six lines in an honest man's hand, I will find in them something to hang him. That is to say, once you have a big and deep enough dossier on anyone, you will find something terminally destructive in there for every person. But that's not the only theory of the history of the future. I have another one for you today, and it's this. That if our technology is designed to serve its users rather than to betray them, we will have the power to use technology to make a world that is better in nearly every way. Because the most significant effect of adding a networked computer to your life is that it reduces the cost of doing things with other people. Here we are, gathering at a conference. In, in, in Florence, we have managed this amazing trick through communications technology that allowed us to collaborate and arrive here. Now, when I was a, an activist in the 1980s, about 98% of my job was writing addresses on envelopes and putting stamps in them. And the remaining 2% of the time was given over to figuring out what to put in the envelopes. And today we get the stamps and we get the envelopes absolutely free. Organi the cost of organizing ourselves is in free fall. Or and organizing work is the project that defines our species. It is the thing that we have been perfecting since the first primate said, I'll watch out for tigers, you take care of the kids, and she's gonna go collect some fruit. This is the thing that lets us transcend the limitations of individual humans and approach something that can, we can really only call superhuman, the ability to do more than one person can do. The internet does not have to serve 
as a force multiplier for spies. We have in our grasp ciphers that can encrypt messages so perfectly that even if all the hydrogen atoms in existence were turned into computers and they labored doing nothing but trying to crack the messages until the heat death of the universe, they would still not have done it. In some deep and mathematical sense, the universe wants us to have secrets. This is why when the NSA and GCHQ uh, freaked out about cryptography, they didn't attack the math. They ran programs like Bull Run and Edge Hill and spent $250 million a year trying to make sure that the math was incorrectly placed in the software. Because when you do the math right, it works. Our networks can be tools that allow us to simultaneously link our efforts to make our world a better place and to keep those, the details of those arrangements secret from the forces of greed and reaction who would love to use our social graphs as a kind of to-do list for midnight arrests, torture, and secret execution. Now, this is something we can only do if we liberate ourselves from the self-serving narratives of a market logic that confiscates our public domain and public institutions and flogs them off like a post-Soviet strongman handing out state industries to his oligarch pals. And from the technologically bankrupt idea that we can fix social problems by breaking computers. A colossally bad idea on the lines of putting a camera in everyone's living room on the off chance that you'll catch someone planning a terrorist act. And then acting all surprised when it turns out that there are lots of people watching through those cameras. Agents who are freelancing, selling surveillance footage out the back door, cameras being watched by people other than legitimate authorities, or spy masters who've been politicized and are looking at government critics in order to find ways to discredit them. I want you to help me avert this future history and find a better one. You whose mission is to preserve our culture and communicate it. We must stop telling patrons that they're not allowed to take pictures in our institutions. If the only way to, uh, to get something placed in your collection is to promise that you're going to prohibit non-flash photography of it, it is not a fit candidate for the collection. You can't convey the mission of cultural preservation and communication to an audience whom you are prohibiting from preserving and communicating their interactions with culture. It's like telling your kids not to stop st start smoking while you light a fresh one off the one that you're about to stub out in the ashtray. We have to refuse the dishonest market logic that says that public archives should pay for digitization by allowing paywalls to be erected between the public and the archives that they already own. We must place our scholarly works in open access journals that hew to the principle that arose in the Enlightenment that says that the difference between rigorous science and superstitious alchemy is not what research you do, but whether you publish your research and let other people review it and criticize it. And above all, and under no circumstances, should we allow digitized artifacts from our collections to be locked up with digital rights management. That I can't let you do that, Dave, stuff that tries to control how files are used once they're on someone else's computer. This is not only ineffective if the piracy wars have taught us nothing, they've taught us that. It also betrays the mission of the museum as an institution conceived for the public good. What is the point of an institution that exacts such a terrible price from its patrons? How can you square the mission of cultural preservation with tactics that require your patrons to allow for hidden programs that surveil and control them? And if that's not enough, consider the future history of a museum where all the digital artifacts you wish to preserve and communicate are locked up with technology that is illegal to remove and whose sole purpose is to prevent the long-term diffusion of their payrolls, payloads. Archives and digital rights management go together like rare book collections and flamethrowers. Every time you use digital rights management, you legitimize, promote, and promulgate technology whose sole purpose is to prevent the preservation and communication that is at the heart of museums. Now, it's not that I reject the idea of rules for how we use cultural artifacts. I'm fine with having some rules of copyright. I'm all for them. 
but let's have those rules determined by an approach that begins with the idea that cultural rules should, should serve free expression and never censorship. That public institutions should serve the public first and foremost. That the nervous system of the information age should be designed and regulated with the care and gravitas due to the place where we live our lives, where we place our freedom and destiny in, and not as a political football. 2,000 years from now, our descendants will be arranging cases full of our artifacts from this moment, this dawn of the information age, and they will wonder about the curators and historians and archivists who were their progenitors, the professionals who, more than anyone else, had it in their power to understand what it meant, what potential it had. We can choose how history remembers us, whether we served a future history in which our informational roads were used to conquer and control us, or to give us the freedom to communicate and collaborate to our enduring and universal benefit. Now, there are people who caricature this whole position. They say that Dr. O, all he thinks is that information wants to be free. But I had a long talk with information about this. We went away for a weekend in the country. We drank white wine. We cried. We hugged. And when it was over, information leaned over and whispered in my ear and confessed that the only thing it wants is for us to stop anthropomorphizing it. Because information doesn't want anything. It's a mere abstraction. But people want to be free. And when the world is made of networked information processing devices, human freedom can only be attained through a free, open, and fair informational infrastructure. And I hope you will help to create it. Thank you. Questions? So we have some time for questions. Is there a roving mic? All right, there's, there's a roving mic. Uh, I remind you that a long rambling statement followed by what do you think of that is not, is technically a question, but not a very good one. All right, sure, yeah. I can repeat the question if anyone has a question. I know that was all very non-controversial, and I'm sure you all agreed with every word, but. Anyone, Bueller? No? All right. Lunch time? Oh no, one in the back. Go. All right, go. Uh, just checking on this. Uh, what are you? What, what's your opinion? Uh, if arts get liberated in a way, it gets free and it's HD on the web, and everybody can download it and do whatever they want with it. Um, what's your point? I mean. What if it gets uh, sold? What if people appropriate it and then put it into a commercial uh, product and start selling it? Are we talking about uh, works with living authors or works from no. archival past, collections? Yeah, like from the past. This. Oh, well, it belongs to the public. Right. Um, and uh, if it belongs to the public, businesses are part of the public. Um, and if we limit the kind of um, activity that people are allowed to undertake with public assets to non-commercial activities, then we foreclose on many commercial activities. Uh, I think the non-commercial sector does amazing things, and I'm active in many parts of it, but I also do things in the commercial sector, and I think that, that um, the problem with market logic is not that markets don't exist, it's just that markets aren't the only way that we conduct our, 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 our activities. And I'm all for having markets, just, you know, for, for the same reason that you don't ask your children to participate in a notional stock market to decide where you're going on holiday this year. We also shouldn't use markets to decide how we're going to build museums. Um, we should use cultural priorities, not, not, not market priorities. But there are other things that markets organize beautifully, and, and I'm all for market activity okay. that uses museum assets. Perfect. Thank you. Plus, it's crisis time, so if... Yeah. It can help, as always. Hi, Turn Hi. Octagal. Uh, can I ask you to repeat your last sentence again really quick, and then I have another question. The last sentence of your speech, it was beautiful. Uh, 
when the world is made up of networked information processing devices, human freedom can only be attained through a free, open, and fair informational infrastructure. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. The question is, if we, uh, we who work in cultural heritage consider the fact that we're working with singularities, each one of these is a singularity made in a specific time, how do we, how do we make the um, singularity approach the ubiquitousness of the internet, the, the internet being everywhere in your pocket at any time? How can we monetize or not even how can we capitalize upon that singularity wow that's a it's a great question it's a use of singularity that i understand but not the one that i'm accustomed to okay. um, how do you conform something whose uh historical value has been that it is a one of a kind exactly. well I think that that one of a kindness is probably overstated for starters i don't know the answer but i'll, I'll pick at the question a bit so uh you walk around Florence, one thing that you're immediately struck by is there's a David on practically every corner, right? Because for centuries, the way you learn to be a sculptor in Florence is by knocking off the best statue you can find. And so, um, although there is a uniqueness and a kind of penumbra of physicality surrounding the Mona Lisa, the David, the, you know, the Last Supper, whatever, uh, it is not um, the end of the story. I mean, you know, the reason the Mona Lisa is famous is not because people went around and described it to each other, right? It's because it was reproduced at very high fidelity many times for centuries, and that's where some of its value arises from. So I think that there's something of a false dichotomy. Now, obviously, more is different. So when things, when anything that anyone wants can be anywhere in an instant at no marginal cost, that's different from if you really wanted to know what the Mona Lisa looked like, you could probably find out. Uh, and I don't know exactly what the best way to capitalize on that is, except to say that our um, reproductive strategies, for lack of a better word, tend to uh, be very mammalian. We, we think a lot, you know, when I became a father, I realized that um, we invest a lot of energy in our reproductive uh, cycles. We, we, we really want to make sure that every reproductive act goes to some terminus that is valuable and good and, and ideal. But like dandelions don't, right? A dandelion doesn't care if every seed germinates. A dandelion cares if every crack has a germinating dandelion in it, right? So when its cost of reproduction is very low, it can afford to be a spammer. It can afford to create 2,000 dandelion seeds that blow off in every direction without any strategy or rhyme or reason in the hopes that every opportunity will be filled. And so with my own books, I've always said I'm, I'm more interested in being sure that everybody who ever wants to pay me gets a chance to read my book than being sure that everybody who reads my book pays me. And these are strategies that are incompatible, right? If you make sure that everybody who reads your book pays you, you will, by definition, miss some of those opportunities to make sure that some of the people who would pay you read your book. When the marginal cost goes that low, I think it behooves us to stop thinking like mammals for a while and start investigating these reproductive strategies that come from very low reproduction cost uh, organisms. That's the best I got. No, I so could I, could I summarize it in a maker sense? So if every single person with a 3D printer out there makes a 3D print of your object, there will be those who want to come and actually see your physical object, see the original? Uh, if everybody has a 3D printed copy of your original object, will more people come and see it? Uh, that to me seems intuitively true. I don't think that's the same as saying um, s no one who 3D prints a copy of the David will say, well, that's, that's good enough for me. There are undoubtedly people who will say, that's good enough for me. In the same way that there are people who come and see the David and go, that's, that's, that's the David? I came all this way for that, right? There are people for whom a 3D printed, low res, extruded plastic David is a perfect substitute for the real thing. The important question isn't, do some people not come who would have come otherwise? The important question is, do more people come than would have come over otherwise overall? And intuitively, it seems to me that if you have an artifact like the David,
that has endured for centuries and, and resonates in so many ways with so many people on so many levels, that a greater exposure is almost certain to bring those people in. There's a, uh, a great UCLA behavioral economics experiment uh, where they brought in two groups of students and they gave each group of students their cho choice of a group of, of, from a collection of posters. And some of the posters were fine art posters and some of them were posters of kittens hanging from branches or like cartoons or, you know, pictures of beautiful meadows taken by schmaltzy photographers. And the, the control group, they were told, rank these pictures from highest to lowest and take the one that you rate highest home. And the experimental group was told, rank these pictures from highest to lowest and explain your ranking and take the one that you like most home. And the, con the control group, they chose the fine art posters. They, they immediately, they looked at that and they said, that's a 10. And the experimental group that had to explain why it was a 10, they chose the kitten posters because describing what's beautiful about a kitten is a lot easier than describing what's beautiful about the David. And the interesting thing was six months later, they called the two groups back for a review and they asked them whether they still had the poster. And the group that chose the fine art posters still had the poster. And the group that chose the kittens had put them in the garbage. And so where you have a thing like David that is still hanging on a thousand walls and you digitize it and you make it available, it seems really unlikely to me that David's value arose from the fact that it hadn't been substituted for enough, right? Or that, or, or, or that it had been, that the number of substitutes had been limited. It seems to me that, that David's value is akin to that, to that ineffability that confounded the experimental group in that experiment. That, that thing that is so hard, I mean, you know, people get doctorates in explaining why the David is nice, right? It's a hard thing. Thank you. Yeah, one over there. Hi. I'm, Hi. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I have very little voice, but I'm music librarian here in Florence in the Conservatory of Music, and we have, uh, you know, music puts things together. So uh, archival documents, printed music, manuscripts, statue, and so on. And of, I would like to know from you, um, a, a very precise things. So, do you think there is a essential different perspective from those in countries who has so many things as Italy has, and those who hasn't and can develop technologies as bad? And of course, we have great problem to preserve originals. And I may add that. My door, the door of my institution is just next to the gallery and we see every day of the year a long queue of people wanting to see David as it was the only one thing in Florence they have to see. Every day of the year. We have to ask permission to go through to our doors. <laughs> so that's very it's fun. But uh, thinking about this, I was thinking the precise question is, how much of the percentage of the uh, things that technology people can earn should be put in preservation of originals? Because this is, and how this should be done. Because for us, the great question is to preserve original. We do not have money and we don't have even time and money to go uh, along to people who develop technologies because our first task has to be to preserve original. So how can we put together this big gap? We need money. So yeah. we need your money. How much of the percentage yeah. of this money should be given from the technological projects to preserve originals? Thank you very much. So I don't know that I have the exact answer to that. Uh, I think, uh, uh, if I may, I would rephrase that as how do we get a government whose evidence-based governance is such that they apportion a reasonable sum of money into cultural preservation, commensurate it with its importance and its um, uh, value in both market and non-market senses, and is also trustworthy and professional enough that it actually manages to extract tax 
from multinational corporations such that it can fund the arts. Like, I think a system of law that singles out one industry, technology, and says from now on you pay a tithe of, you know, three and a half percent of your net earnings to music archiving is a highly specific law that would be unlikely to survive in the long term and remain valid. Whereas a project that says government should govern well and not be corrupt and captured by enormous multinationals such that they can go around the world paying no tax and claim that their income is actually all living in a place in the Irish Sea uh, where there, nobody has any jurisdiction over it. Um, that is a harder project, right? It's, it's a much less instrumental project, but the dividends of that project don't just get paid into your music archive, they get paid into my daughter's school and the hospital my grandmother is in and the roads that we all drive on and, you know, everything else. And to tie this back into the question of technology, one of the things that I truly believe is that the only way that we will make a change is through collective action. No one of us is going to be able to confront Berlusconi, to confront Putin, to confront David Cameron and say, enough of this, let's have, let's have good governance. The only way we can do it is in large groups. And the only way we can assemble those large groups is over the internet. And the only way that we'll be able to use the internet to do that is if it's free and open. That for me, this is why this is, I used to work on a lot of issues. I, I'm, I'm still involved a little in climate change and disarmament and so on. But I've taken on this question of network openness and fairness because I feel like none of those other issues can be solved unless we as people who are upset about the state of the world and the way that its priorities have been apportioned can organize together to demand a better one. Now, every time I come to Italy, they ask me about Beppe Grillo. And I, I don't know his politics very well. I know a little and I know it sounds all right to me, but I think his tactics have been amazing. And that idea of a networked public who demand better governance from the entrenched power is, the, is our only hope. And it's the common cause that the museum sector has with the educational sector, with everybody else who cares about public works, with anti-poverty activists, this idea of good governance. They, 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 the idea that we just continue to have horrible, manifestly unfair, corrupt government, but we fix the one problem of music archiving is an unsatisfying answer and unlikely to sustain us. So I don't have a specific recommendation for how much money Google should give to music. But I do have a specific recommendation that says that government should make Google pay their fair, fair share of taxes and that they should, on behalf of the people, apportion that money in a way that accords with the importance of music archiving. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, oh, we've had many tweets asking whether your uh, talk will be available. I spoke to your public. I, I spoke to your publisher last night and said I'd email her a copy. Brilliant. So. Okay, so that will be posted online, probably in many, many places. Um, dandelion seeds uh, sprouting and, 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 and bringing forth life everywhere. So now that we've been fed intellectually and uh, our souls have also been nourished, let's go eat and then come back um, after lunch for the um, program, the part of the program that was derived from our open call for papers, um, which is really the heart and the meat of what we're doing here today, and I'm very much looking forward to it and uh, very grateful to everyone who's participating in that and who's come very long distances to contribute. So thanks, Corey. Thank you. Thank you all, and we'll see you at lunch.